Um, thank you all for coming today. I'm excited to talk to you here, kind of like right in the heart of Silicon Valley, where so many amazing things happen and so many deeply, deeply questionable things happen. Um, I want to start out today uh, by talking about something that might seem rather small, and in fact is rather small, in the scheme of technology and in the scheme of problems that I think we are facing, because I think it's actually a really useful example of the way small things can go wrong. So this example is with Google Maps. And uh, a little while back, about a year ago or so, Google Maps launched a new update. It was not like previous Google Maps updates where it was about sort of improving your ability to get from point A to point B. It was actually about something different, which was giving you a new piece of data. The piece of data that they wanted to start giving you was in addition to, okay, how long is it going to take you if you're going to take the bus or if you're going to walk or if you're going to drive. They also decided to start telling you if you chose to walk, how many calories you might burn as opposed to taking some other form of transit. So there's this new piece of data that they start putting out into Google Maps. But they decided not just to tell you how many calories you might burn, what they also decided you really needed to know was how many mini cupcakes that would be. So this walk will burn 1.5 mini cupcakes, three mini cupcakes, almost a mini cupcake. Now, I don't know how many of you are on a mini cupcake based diet. Probably not a lot of you because I feel like that would be a very short lived lifestyle um, because you would feel pretty awful probably within a day or two. I also don't really know what a mini cupcake is, like how big is a mini cupcake, who's mini cupcake, what purveyor of mini cupcakes did this come from? No idea. But what I do know is that they launched this to uh, several hundred thousand iPhone users to start out. And almost immediately after they launched this update, they started getting some feedback. One of the ones that I really loved um, came around 8 o'clock PM, the night that she got it. This journalist, Taylor Lawrence. Taylor Lawrence writes about technology a lot. Her work is great. Um, but she started tweeting about it. And I just want to walk you through what she went through as she started playing with this feature. Around 8 o'clock p.m., she notes that it's happening. And the first thing she notices is, oh, wow, here's a new thing that exists. And pretty soon after that, she's like, huh, I didn't actually opt into this. And you can't opt out of it. And then she starts walking through all of her feelings about it immediately. This is just her encountering this product feature the first time, right? So one thing she's like, this is really triggering if you've had an eating disorder. She talks about how it just generally feels shaming. She talks about how like nutritionists don't all agree about calorie counting in the first place. She talks about some of the difficulties in understanding sort of what we mean by calories. She talks about like why mini cupcakes, on and on and on, up until about nine o'clock that night. So between 8 and 9 o'clock p.m., she covers all of these different reasons that this particular product feature might be bad, right? She talks about the fact that nobody opted in, couldn't opt out, eating disorders, general shaminess, calories. Um, why, why cupcakes? Who needs cupcake data in their life? I don't know. Um, one of the things that came up, and it wasn't worded exactly this way, my interpretation is that like a pink cupcake is not really a neutral food. Like a pink cupcake is sort of encoded with a lot of cultural meaning, which is to say cupcakes are very American. Cupcakes are also very kind of white and middle class. And a pink cupcake is very feminized. And all of those things are kind of important when you think about this being something you're going to roll out to sort of the world. And then finally, the last one she had was that it perpetuates diet culture. Now, you could look at these examples and you could say, I disagree with that. You could look at this and you could say, actually, I think that feature would be fun and helpful for me. I don't mind the cupcake at all. And that's fine. You could have all of those opinions. But the fact is, in the course of one hour, she came up with a lot of different reasons and a lot of different people for whom this feature was actually a big problem. Right? Over the course of one hour, she came up with all of these flaws with this particular feature. Within three hours, Google took the feature down. So great, they took the feature down. It seemed ill-conceived. But I look at that and I think, OK, but how long did they spend on this? Right? How much time did it take them to build this particular feature? How many meetings did they have? How many people were involved? Who are all the bodies this had to go through for it to actually get launched? Now, Google has a lot of money, and maybe we don't care about them wasting some of that money on ill-conceived features. However, at no point along the way did anybody say, hey, what if this is a bad idea? Or even if they did, they weren't listened to. 
I've been in a lot of meetings in a lot of tech companies, and I can tell you, I bet they spent more time debating like what color the frosting should be on the cupcake or um, comparing illustration options from multiple illustrators than they did asking the question, who does this fail for? And I think about this example all the time. I think about it all the time because I think it's a perfect encapsulation of like the way that we often in technology get so narrowly focused on this one version of things that we think is going to be great. And we don't really think about the impact of what we're making on the people around us, on the communities that we're dealing with, and on society at large. And there's all these small choices, and I think that the small choices are actually really important. The small choices that you might end up making if you're working in industry and you're out there you know, working with a design team or UX team or a technical team, and you're making these little choices day to day about how a product works that can actually add up to huge oversights. So for example, uh, my friend Dan Hahn got this email from his scale. And I love this email very much. Um, he has a smart scale, so he gets email from his scale, of course, right? Here we are. Um, and he gets this email from his scale that, that you may notice here um, is made out not to Dan, but to somebody named Calvin. Your hard work will pay off, Calvin. Don't be discouraged by last week's results. We believe in you. Let's set a weight goal to help you shed those extra pounds. You may also notice that the average weight of Calvin is uh, 29.2 pounds. Because Calvin is a toddler, and it's super weird that every week he weighs more. And this scale is very confused by that because obviously gaining weight is bad. So the scale is gonna give you this handy reminder to just drop some of those pounds. Because the people who decided these product features, they didn't think about anything else besides weight loss as being positive and maintaining a weight as being positive. And the idea that somebody would gain weight week after week could only be a problem. And then there's the flip side of that too, which is the same product. This is a push notification actually that Dan's wife received um, that was congratulating her. Congratulations, you've hit a new low weight. Now, she did not sign up on a weight loss plan with the scale. It wasn't like she told the scale that like she was trying to lose weight. All she did was use the product, set a, sign up for the app, and she started getting these push notifications. For this particular push notification, she had just weighed herself after giving birth. And it was, in fact, a new low weight. Um, but it wasn't a new low weight for any sort of congratulatory reason exactly. And it was kind of funny that she got this right after giving birth, but there's so many people that this is actually not at all funny for, right? This is actually very problematic if you're somebody who has an eating disorder, like we talked about before, but also people who, let's say, um, have a chronic condition. I know people with chronic illnesses where they have to really monitor all of these different signals and signs in their life of whether something's going wrong or not. And for them, some people, like, losing weight is actually a signal that they're getting sick. It's a small thing in some ways to get this sort of congratulatory message, but it speaks to that kind of narrow focus and the way that we're not really thinking about the range of people that use our products. And it can come down to just like a tiny little bit of copy that reveals the biases, reveals the way that we're excluding people in the things that we make, and reveals just how little the people who are designing technology are thinking about people. This is from a period tracking app. It is called uh, Cycles. And many period tracking apps um, have this feature, or a similar feature, where you can share your data with a partner. I love talking about period tracking apps because I think people are uncomfortable when you talk about menstruation, and you shouldn't be. And I also love talking about period tracking apps because um, so much weird gender bias and like weird sort of ideas about people get embedded in them. So there's like rich ground. But in this particular period tracking app, the way that they have talked about their feature to share your information with a partner is super heteronormative. And for no reason, right? Like it's just copy. It says just between you and him, keep him in the loop. There is literally no reason it needs to do this. There is nothing about the feature that works better if your partner is male. It's like you're adding an email address, right? But nobody thought about it and nobody flagged it. And you can take a product like this and bring it to market without anybody saying like, hmm, what if a user has a partner that's not a man? And if that's not coming up, where are all the other places they've made assumptions about who is using this product and why they're using this product, right? If nobody is noticing something that's so close to the surface like this, this thing that you could change in literally four seconds of copywriting, what else aren't they noticing? And so I think about these small things so much, and one of my favorites is this one um, from, from Tumblr. And I wanna walk through this a little bit because I love it so much. So uh, Tumblr, 
um, sends out a push notification to a woman named Sally Rooney. She's an Irish novelist. Actually, her novels are awesome. They're available in the US now. Um, but at the time that she got this, she was like a to be published author. And so like a lot of authors who are trying to get published, she was on Twitter a lot. She tweeted out this screenshot that she got from Tumblr. Beep, beep, neo-Nazis is here. And it went viral. And I talked to her about it. And she said that when she tweeted this out, she was actually really freaked out because she was like, oh no, have I accidentally followed neo-Nazi tags on Tumblr? Like, am I, am I a neo-Nazi fan in Tumblr's system? Like, what is happening here? Why am I getting this? And she couldn't figure out why. She was going through her settings. She couldn't find any reason that she would be getting the latest neo-Nazi content sent to her phone. And uh, what she finally found out when she talked to people at Tumblr was that it was because she'd read a couple of posts about the rise of neo-fascism in the United States. And so Tumblr decided that obviously she wanted to have push notifications of all the freshest neo-Nazi content. Now, that's one side of it. The other thing that's happening here is, of course, the notification she got. Beep, beep, neo-Nazis is here, which totally doesn't really work very well. Um, and in fact, somebody else started sharing like, other screenshots they got for the same notification, but with different content. Uh, so there was one guy who shared, uh, beep, beep, mental illness is here. And he was like, well, they're not wrong, but I don't really feel great about this. Um, so of course, you know, nobody sat down and wrote, beep, beep, neo-Nazis. Um, what they did is, of course, they wrote a text string, right? So somebody wrote a text string that's like, beep, beep, trending topic is here. And then that text string goes into their system, and that could get pulled out for different circumstances, different reasons, right? This text string just doesn't actually work well for a lot of different topics people might be talking about on Tumblr. It kind of only works if you're talking about something fun. And Tumblr being fun might have been sort of one of the original purposes for it. But certainly, there's a million people using Tumblr for all kinds of reasons, to talk about all kinds of issues, including neo-Nazis and mental illness, and a million other things. But the real reason I wanted to bring this up is that I was fascinated by the conversation that happened afterwards. So on Twitter, the lead writer at Tumblr at the time, I'm not sure if he's still there, Tag Savage, he said, just kind of off the cuff, he said something that was really revealing to me and that I think su like summarizes so much of what the problem is. We talked about getting rid of it, that notification, but it performs kind of great. Hmm. That mentality, we could not do this, but you know what? It performs. I think that that is what's underlying so many of the really huge consequences that we are seeing emerging constantly in tech. So many of them that like, I'm not even going to be able to mention some of the most recent ones because it's like every day I got to be up on the news. But for example, how many of you saw uh, this story from about a year ago when um, James Bridal first started talking about this? It's YouTube's creepy kid video problem. So what was happening was um, YouTube had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of videos of creepy and weird violent content that was being marketed at kids and showing up in their kids app. This is one screenshot. This is a knockoff Peppa Pig video. So in the traditional Peppa Pig cartoon, I don't know how many of you watch Peppa Pig, I do not. Um, but the way I understand it, traditional one, Peppa Pig uh, is scared of the dentist, goes to the dentist, it turns out okay. That's how kids' TV works. In this version, Peppa Pig is scared of the dentist, goes to the dentist, and then it morphs into a violent graphic torture scene. So there were thousands upon thousands of videos like this, um, not just Peppa Pig, not just cartoons, also live action, with all kinds of super creepy, violent, sexualized, and just plain weird content. And they were being uploaded and tagged with kind of a keyword salad, is what James Bridal called them. And then, because they would have all these keywords in them that were keywords that kids liked, like keywords that related to things that, that they knew kids already liked, and they'd be tagged with things like the brand names for the cartoons kids were looking for, um, they'd be auto-played and promoted to kids. So you start out, you know, if you maybe hand an iPad to a kid in a restaurant, or they're watching something in the back of a car on a long drive, or I'm not a parent, but from what I understand, you just need 30 quiet minutes. You hand the kid the iPad, and they're starting out by watching something on the traditional channel, and it's a regular Peppa Pig video, and you think, fine. And then suddenly, without even realizing it, they're immersed in a deeper, weirder, darker web, and you don't even know what's happening. And the thing is, this content performed. This content got a lot of views. That was good for YouTube. 
And there's a lot of content like that that has been good for YouTube. Um, I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to some of the stories coming out recently about the way that YouTube kind of sort of sends people toward more and more extreme content. I find this one very funny where it's just sort of like, yes, I just want to watch these videos in order. They're labeled 1 through 50. Let me watch them in order. And YouTube is like, mm, maybe you want to watch number 7, then number 14, and then neo-Nazis. And that's actually a lot of what happens on YouTube. So this is very, this was a funny tweet, went around the internet. But then uh, it turns out that that was a really, really common way that YouTube was working. So Zainab Tufekci started talking about this last year. She said, you know, during the 2016 election, she made a point of watching YouTube videos um, of Donald Trump rallies because she was trying to, you know, see what was actually happening at these rallies. She was writing an article about it. Soon I noticed something peculiar, peculiar, excuse me. YouTube started to recommend an autoplay videos for me that featured white supremacist rants, Holocaust denials, and other disturbing content. Okay, so it immediately went from, oh, you're interested in Donald Trump, you have to watch this Holocaust denial video next. Obviously, that's what you want. But it wasn't just that. So she got interested in that, and she said, okay, I'm going to create a new, fresh YouTube account. Um, and I don't know sure how many of you are familiar with Zainab Tufekci. She's a digital sociologist. Um, She's a professor, uh, and she went through this with sort of research rigor, and she said, okay, I'm gonna create this new account, I'm gonna see what happens. Started watching Hillary and Bernie videos. Lo and behold, very, very quickly, the YouTube algorithm started showing her videos of conspiracy theories, things like the existence of secret government agencies, allegations that the US government was behind the attacks of September 11th, almost immediately, right? Just sending her down this more extreme path. She found that it was happening over and over, no matter what she watched. It wasn't just watching political stuff. She watches something about vegetarianism, and they're recommending a video about veganism. You start watching something about jogging, and there's, suddenly you're watching stuff about ultra marathons. You're never hardcore enough for YouTube's recommendation algorithm. It's always sending you to content that is more and more extreme, upping the ante. And maybe that's not a super big problem if you're talking about things like running videos, but it starts to get to be a big problem when we're talking about things like extremism. You know, a friend of mine actually recently told me that this was happening to her own mom, where her mom um, is Jewish and was watching some YouTube videos about Israel, and then suddenly she was watching some extremely conservative videos about Israel, and then suddenly she was watching stuff that was just blatantly anti-Arab. And she hadn't quite realized what was happening. She thought she was learning about her faith. And she was getting sucked deeper and deeper into this web. And the thing is, this content performs kind of great. You can make a lot of money promoting extreme content to people. So recently, uh, just this month, um, there was a story that came out out of YouTube about how long employees have been raising their hands and saying that this is a problem. And so one employee said that they wanted to flag troubling videos that weren't quite hate speech, but that were like close to it um, and stop recommending them, right? So if something is sort of near the cusp of being considered hate speech, maybe we shouldn't be pushing that in people's faces. Somebody else wanted to track uh, videos in a spreadsheet to try to chart some of the popularity of extremist content and sort of like keep tabs on it and see what was happening over time. Somebody else was really getting scared of the alt-right video bloggers. They wanted to create a vertical to show how popular those people were. Every time they got the same response, don't rock the boat. That's a big problem at YouTube. That's been a big problem at YouTube for a while, but it's not a big problem only at YouTube. It is a big problem throughout this industry that we are right smack in the heart of. For example, I want to talk a little bit about a very different story with some of the same underlying problems, and it takes us into Germany. Um, so Altena, Germany is a small town, you can see right there, kind of near uh, Cologne and Dusseldorf. And in Altena, Germany, um, this is a town that took in a lot of refugees, and it had a really positive feeling about refugees. So they were allowing all these refugees in, and there was all of these events to welcome the refugees into the community. Um, there was all kinds of campaigns to donate things to the refugee families coming in. There's generally positive sentiment about refugees being part of their community. But then in 2015, a young firefighter trainee named Dirk Denkhaus went and tried to light this house on fire, which was a refugee group home. Now, Dirk Denkhaus had no history of extremism. He had no history of violence. Nobody thought that this was something that he would do. He wasn't even particularly political. There was only one thing that he'd been doing, just one thing he'd been doing, that they could point to that had led him down this path. He'd been using Facebook, and he'd been using it a lot. 
And in fact, this community, Altena as a whole, was using Facebook a lot, higher than the national average usage. And in Altena, Germany, and in a lot of other places in Germany, um, some researchers started looking at all of these different hate crimes, all of these different attacks on refugees. And um, what they found when they looked at 3,335 anti-refugee attacks in Germany, all of the attacks over a two-year period, what they found was that there was one thing that correlated all of them. And it wasn't how much income the community had, it wasn't uh, whether the community had a high level of education or a lower level of education. It wasn't whether the community was historically more left-wing or right-wing. It had nothing to do with things like how many newspapers were sold in the community or whether there was a history of hate crime in the community prior to the refugees coming in. The one thing that tied everything together, the one thing that was consistent across the board, was higher than average Facebook usage. Anywhere where Facebook use was higher than average, they experienced more attacks on refugees. It was true in virtually any community, big city or small town, affluent or struggling, liberal haven or far right stronghold. Anytime per person Facebook usage was one standard deviation above the national average, attacks on refugees increased 50%. Reliably, over and over. And so what they started finding in this study was that the algorithm was built around that one core mission, a kind of the same core mission of YouTube, right? Maximizing user engagement. And anything that tapped into negative primal emotions like anger or fear performed best. They performed kind of great. And so anti-refugee sentiment was really common on Facebook, even in a town like Altena, that actually in real life had a pro-refugee sentiment. The thing you would see on Facebook was as if all of your neighbors agreed that the refugees were bad, even when that wasn't true. And so what you have over and over and over again is a system that's prioritizing right, these extreme views, all for the sake of what? Connecting people. This is from a memo that Andrew Bosworth, Boz at Facebook, um, wrote in 2016, but was just leaked last year. And it was about ugly truths. And he, he said that the ugly truth is we believe connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. All the work we do in growth is justified, all the questionable contact importing practices, all the subtle language that helps you stay searchable by friends, all of it. And as I'm sure you know, things like subtle language that helps you stay searchable by friends, that's like privacy settings you cannot understand and that encourage you to be as open as possible, the work we do in growth, all the work we do to reach more people more often. Anything that allows us to connect people is de facto good. So by that logic, content that promotes refugee attacks is de facto good because it's popular. right? If that is how you look at it, if you are to the point where anything that connects more people more often is de facto good, then you can justify anything. And of course they have. Facebook's historically made quite a lot of money. I believe they made $55 billion last year. They may even be on, on track to exceed that this year, although uh, I hear they might be fined $5 billion, so we'll see, um, for their privacy violations over Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> we'll see if they can still net higher than $55 billion. But they had $55 billion in ad revenue last year, right? They only had $40 billion in 2017. So in the year that Cambridge Analytica happened in, in the year that we started seeing an endless amount of negative press coming out about Facebook, they still made a record amount of money. And so what we're really getting at is a system and technology where so many of the companies that I think we've spent a lot of years idolizing or looking to as being sort of leaders, they're not just vulnerable to being abused. They're actually literally optimized for it because the exact thing that makes them money is the thing that is causing problems in society, right? They are optimized around abuse. And the thing is, it's not just about sort of big tech, social media. There are so many challenges that we are facing across technology, across any technology adjacent industry, when it comes down to all of the decisions that we're now looking to technology to help us make, and all of the ways that we're embedding technology into all kinds of things, and the amount of bias that we are also embedding along with that technology. So I want to talk a little bit about that problem, too. Um, there's so many issues coming up constantly about algorithmic bias. Endless examples, and I'm just going to talk about a couple um, that I think really help to sort of start thinking and, and driving the point home. One of them is a system called uh, word to vec word to vec came out a couple of years ago, and what word to vec does, it's uh, taking words and finding vectors. So it is helping with natural language processing by finding relationships between words, right? And the idea is that that can help you with some like higher ordered thinking. 
So what they did is they took, this is uh, researchers at Google, they took Google News articles and they found um, three million words from those Google News articles. And they said, okay, what are the relationships between these three million words and what can that tell us about how language works and what things mean? And so it could start doing some stuff that was pretty cool and was pretty helpful. Like it could fill out an analogy for you. And that's useful when you're thinking about the way that natural language processing needs to sort of be able to mimic sort of our human understanding of things. Analogies are really helpful for that. So Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. Awesome, great, right? However, it could also fill out other kinds of analogies that are maybe not quite as awesome. Like a uh, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. Now, that is not true in the same way that Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. But for word to vec that was literally true. It was just as true. Because in the data that it had learned from, three million Google News articles, right? From that data, that was true. The relationship between man and computer programmer was similar to the relationship between woman and homemaker. And when you pause and think about that, you're like, okay, well, you can actually see why that might happen, right? You think about Google News articles. Well, Google News articles are written by journalists. So they're written by people. People have biases. Okay, that's one. Also, people have jobs, and there's probably a lot more women who are quoted in Google News articles who had their job listed with them, um, who were homemakers than there were men, right? There are probably very few men who said that their job or their title or they weren't referenced as a homemaker. That would be unlikely, okay. Um, and then you just think about all of the different ways that that language plays out over time. And then you also have to think about things like, well, who do journalists cite in their work? Do they tend to cite more men than women? Yes, that's actually true. Um, they, it's oftentimes you will find that the uh, number of men cited in a piece where they're looking at an expert perspective is like multiple times the number of women. And so the data doesn't necessarily reflect truth. It doesn't even necessarily reflect reality. What it reflects is a body of information, right? And that body of information is only what that body of information is. So the algorithm wasn't wrong. It was just only trained off of a very, very limited amount of info. But what's happening and what you see constantly is you see companies, all kinds of companies that are snapping up natural language processing packages and using them, right? You just pull them into whatever other thing you're building and you don't necessarily think about who built it and how they built it and whether it's good or bad. You're not necessarily thinking about whether this is something that's going to uh, perpetuate biases. You're just thinking that you need to do natural language processing because you're building a chat bot and here's a package of natural language processing that I can just buy and plug in. And so we start to think about the way that we end up with these, bi these biases really embedded deeply in places and with people who don't necessarily think about that and don't know about it and aren't there to de-bias these results. In fact, I don't know how many of you saw the um, story come out a couple months ago where Amazon was like, yeah, we tried to create a hiring tool using AI and it wouldn't stop discriminating against women. This one was interesting because they worked on it for like two years and they had to throw the whole thing away. Two years, because um, their premise was that they wanted to find and recruit ideal candidates, right? Amazon's grown very rapidly. Uh, we could talk about the Amazon business model another day, but Amazon has grown very rapidly. They wanted to find and recruit ideal candidates, maybe some people like you all here. And so what they did is they said, okay, well, what is an ideal candidate? Well, an ideal candidate must be similar to all of the successful employees that we've had over the years. So they took 10 years of data about the people they'd actually hired, right? So 10 years of resumes that they received and pulled the ones of our people that they actually hired in the company. And they said, yes, this is what good looks like. Get us more people like this. What they found was that actually this revealed a lot more about their hiring practices than it did about actually getting good people in the door because they found that it immediately downgraded any resume that used the word woman. So let's say you went to women's college or maybe you were on like a women's lacrosse team. Maybe you were in a women's leadership group. You would lose points immediately. Interestingly, it didn't care whether you knew desired coding languages. So if the job listing required you to know Python, it did not care if your resume said Python because in Amazon's actual hiring history, that was not a factor that actually mattered about who got hired. However, it did really care 
what kind of language you used. And if you use terms like executed and captured, more uh, aggressive terminology, it would give you extra points as being a better candidate. Turns out that it was almost entirely men who happened to use that language. So lo and behold, all of the best candidates still are men. Again, they spent two years on this and they had to throw the whole thing away because they couldn't figure out how to debias these results because the entire premise, right, we're gonna hire people like we've hired in the past, turned out to be a problem. It turned out that the bias existed before you even got to building any of the technology. Or how many of you have heard about Predictum? Yes, Predictum came out a couple months ago. Um, Predictum's a fun one, where um, if you are a parent and you want to hire somebody to take care of your children, so a nanny or a babysitter, you want to have somebody you can trust, of course, right? And so Predictum says, well, we're gonna help you see who's trustworthy by having you run people who might be taking care of your children through this screening process, where we are going to look at their social media and we're gonna figure out, are they trustworthy or not? The way that they did this is they said, okay, you wanna find people you can trust? Well, let's figure out what a good babysitter looks like. So who did they ask? They asked uh, what they called mommy bloggers. Um, so they were basically like, let's go talk to moms who run blogs and ask them what they look for in a babysitter. That may or may not be representative of what parents in general want. I would argue it's probably very much not representative of parents in general. But that's who they asked, and that was the criteria that they got. Then what they did is they trained an algorithm to assess prospects social media posts against those standards. So they said, okay, this is an ideal babysitter. Now let's compare what you post online to that ideal babysitter. I would always, I would never be hired as a babysitter if this was the criteria. Um, okay, but that's, that's what we're gonna use, right? We're gonna use what you post online to decide are you a good babysitter or not. Now, a neural net would then go in and classify what you said on social media as abusive or polite, positive or negative, and then they had a second model that would decide your risk level, how risky of a babysitter are you based off of that. One of the interesting things about this particular piece of software is that the AI was trained to go out and try to find instances of you out there that you had tried to keep private. So for example, let's say you had social media accounts that were not only not using your real name and not using a photo of yourself, but that were also not tied to an email address that was the email address that you were using um, on your resume, that you had tried to keep private and separate from your professional profile. It was still trying to go out and find those, right? So it's gonna find your secret Twitter, and it's gonna take a look at how risky you are. So there's a journalist, Brian Merchant at Gizmodo. He wrote about putting people he knows through the process, and the first person he put through was Kiana. Kiana is his actual babysitter. This is the person he entrusts with the care of his children. And um, when he started putting her through the process, um, he started noticing very quickly that she was considered low risk, but not the lowest risk. And that actually down there, it's a little hard to read in yellow, but she was listed as a moderate risk for disrespectful attitude. Now, you may notice that Kiana is a black woman. You may know that there's a history of calling black women disrespectful. And so he started wondering, hmm, why do they think Kiana is disrespectful exactly? Why is she a moderate risk here? And so he started looking at, okay, well, what are the social media posts that it found that it decided were problematic? Didn't put on any makeup, but I got that post poop glow. It's one of them, which I'm sorry, I just think is funny. Um, she says our legal system is an effing crazy map. She hasn't decided if she's an indigo child or a narcissist. And 2018 is the year that she stops talking shit. Those are the posts that it decided were too disrespectful for her to be a good babysitter. Now. You could say that like, oh yeah, that's a little disrespectful, or like, I see why that would be flagged, or maybe you're fine with that. But what I think is really interesting is the second person he ran through the system, which is a friend of his who is a stand-up comic. You might see where this is going. Okay, so his friend Nick is a stand-up comic. Uh, you will notice this, that he was labeled as low risk, very low risk, no flags whatsoever. And unlike Kiana, who had that yellow bar that was like moderate risk, disrespectful attitude, nothing for him. So what are the kinds of things that he tweets about? Well, here are just a few choice samples from his profile. He um, talks about uh, Tom Brady and the vice president involved in a sexual act. He uh, refers to the president uh, by various, various uh, unkind uh, descriptors. Um, 
he is in general, I would say, I would argue demonstrably less respectful because of one key difference, nothing in Kiana's profile was directed at anybody else, right? There was nobody that she was saying anything to. This is all directed at specific human people. Now, as you probably guess, I have uh, not great opinions about uh, the current president, but that aside, that's still a person and you're still directing hate at a specific person, right? Um, this was labeled as zero, right? Zero, totally neutral, totally fine, totally fine. So Brian Merchant went and talked to the people behind Predictum and he's like, what gives? And they were immediately like, we're not racist, we're not racist, we're definitely not racist. We are definitely not racist. <laughs> because they said, you know, well, there's no way we could be racist. We can't be racist because, you see, we don't look at ethnicity or skin color. They're not even things in the algorithm. There's no way for us to enter that data. But it isn't about whether there's a field that says like, is this person black, check here. That's not what it's about, it's about inferences, right? It's about all of these different tiny little pieces of data that this algorithm is using in ways that actually he probably does not understand because it's doing all kinds of work behind the scenes and making more and more and more assumptions as it goes. So the algorithm is what? It's picking up on sentiment. Sentiment deemed to be problematic by some group of people. So the question is, whose sentiment is it picking up on? Who are the people that think that this is problematic? Well, that depends on what the training data was, right? So what was the training data that it learned from? What were the norms of that training data? And then whose definition of aggressive are we talking about? Whose definition of angry? Who in our society gets labeled as aggressive and angry all the time? Turns out black women. Now, I don't actually know what's happening in this algorithm. And in fact, I doubt he does either. Um, but the real, the real problem here is we can't look underneath the hood because there is no transparency because they don't share any of the information about how this thing makes decisions because all of that, of course, is proprietary. So just the other day, a report came out from the AI Now Institute. If you're interested in this stuff, I strongly recommend reading it. It's called Gender, Race, and Power in AI. And they talk about how large-scale AI systems are almost exclusively developed places like this, right? Elite university laboratories. Hmm, wonder what they might mean by that. And then spaces in the West that are extremely white, affluent, technically oriented, and male. Hmm, wonder where that is. Um, we are in the middle of a place that is designing a lot of technology from a very limited point of view. And that in that particular dynamic, you have a tremendous diversity problem that is making its way into all the artificial intelligence that we are building and all kinds of billions of different applications, right? And one thing that they noted in this that I really wanna point out is that it's not just about women because so often when I talk to people in tech, there's a conversation that then goes to like women in technology, which is a huge issue for sure. But, you know, I'm a white woman working in technology, and one of the things that I know is that also, also that leaves out a huge number of people, right? We're talking about gender, but we're also talking about race, and we're fundamentally talking about power. It affects how AI companies work, what products get built, who they're designed to serve, and who benefits from their development. And if we're not taking all of that into account in the things that we're making and the things that we're researching, even here at Stanford, then we are not going to be able to build things that I think we can be proud of in five years or 10 years. I think we're gonna look back at this time and maybe be deeply ashamed of a lot of the choices that we made. And so, what do we do with that? Where do we start? How do we change things? There's a lot of work to be done. That is a very big question, but I wanna talk about just a couple things that I think can start to shift thinking and open people up to, to looking at their work differently and then hopefully opening up lots and lots of new ways of working. And one of them is really thinking about how could our work hurt someone? This is a quote from Zoe Quinn. Uh, she was kind of at the center of Gamergate, targeted by trolls incessantly for years. And she said, you know, if you're not asking yourself how could this be used to hurt someone in your design or engineering process, you failed. Somebody at Twitter could have used that like 10 years ago, uh, also still today. Um, but if you're not asking yourself, how could this be used to hurt someone, you're probably gonna hurt someone. So we need to be thinking so much more about the assumptions that we're making in everything that we create. 
Like for example, if we look at just that little tiny product choice in the scale earlier, right? Just this like one little thing it would actually be pretty easy to tweak this so that you're not sending people emails about losing weight for their toddler. Um, but if you look at this particular feature, you see actually a whole bunch of assumptions if you try to work backwards from it. Here are just a few of them. The user's weight is extra pounds, right? So it's saying like, you must have extra pounds. We've decided for you, you have extra pounds. The user is trying to lose weight, that that's a goal of theirs, even though they never told you that was a goal of theirs. There's also an assumption that the user feels bad about their weight because there's all this messaging that's like, buck up, it's gonna be okay. And there's an assumption that the user wants the scale's help to lose weight, as opposed to just wanting to like gain knowledge or data from the scale. All of those assumptions get baked in and lead to the scenario where you're sending people all of these weight loss emails who did not sign up for them and didn't want them. Now, when we look at these kinds of problems, one of the things that I hear very often is that this is an edge case. Because, you know, most people, if they are gaining weight week after week, you know, that's a bad thing. And most people, you know, they do want to lose weight. I mean, you know, America has an ep epidemic of obesity. So for most people, this is going to work most of the time. So that's really an edge case, and we can't worry about that. And I think that that kind of framing, edge cases can be useful in certain kinds of, like, conversations about technology, but yeah, very rarely is an edge case useful when you're fundamentally talking about people. Because when you're talking about people, you're basically saying this doesn't matter, right? You're saying you don't matter. You're too far outside the norm for us to care about you. Um, a couple years ago, um, when I was working on a, a book called Design for Real Life um, with my friend Eric Meyer, we reframed that and we said, okay, this isn't an edge case. Like an edge case is not a useful term when we're starting to talk about how we make things for other humans. We need to talk about them as stress cases. And the idea of a stress case is not just to say, um, like, somebody in a literal stressful scenario, although that's part of it. It's to say, well, what happens, what happens to our design decision or our technology choice? What happens to this feature if we put it under stress? If we put it under the pressure of somebody who's not necessarily our ideal customer or isn't necessarily having a normal use case? What happens if that person's use case is a little bit outside of what we typically think of when we're designing this product? Does it still work or not? Are we failing them? And what we found is that oftentimes it was actually really easy. If you started thinking about stress cases, it was very easy to recognize little things that could be big problems for people and to make tweaks that would actually make it work better for everybody. The idea being that if you can make something work for people who have maybe a little bit of a special circumstance, that you can oftentimes make it work better for everybody who has the normal use case as well. So recently, um, a friend of mine shared this, this um, diagram that Fjord started using, where they built off of the stress case idea, and uh, they started saying that there's like a quadrant that they want to think about. So basically, their take is, look, if you go into a project, and you're only thinking about use cases, which is typical, you're only gonna be thinking about the situations where people are using the product in the way you want, and um, they're they are intentionally using the product correctly. And it's one quadrant of how a product gets used. It's like, look, you cannot actually plan for every potential case, but if you don't think about some of the cases in the other quadrants, you're going to miss huge things. So the way that this is designed is to look at both um, so stress cases, which is where somebody is using the product correctly, but it's unintentionally failing them, right? Um, but also to look at things like abuse and misuse cases. So a misuse case is when it's unintentional, but they're using the product incorrectly. And then an abuse case is when they're intentionally using the product incorrectly. They're using it to hurt someone or they're using it to, you know, steal data, right? Like those, those abuse cases. Oftentimes the only negative scenarios that I've seen companies actually go after are abuse cases, if anything. And the entire other side of the quadrant is ignored. I think starting to think about what are the use cases, what are the situations that we haven't thought enough about, and how can we make sure that we're vetting some of our decisions through more lenses. I think about this quote from Alex Stamos a lot. He left Facebook last year as the chief security officer, and when he left, he wrote this memo where he said, you know, the problems that Facebook's facing right now, they're due to tens of thousands of small decisions. Tens of thousands of small decisions made over the last decade. And I think about those little decisions because I think about all of the little like weight shamey emails and all the little copy about neo-Nazis. And I think, you know, it's not like fixing that stuff or being aware of that stuff is gonna solve major massive ethical issues embedded in the business models of technology.
But I do think that every one of those small decisions and every time we write them off and every time we're kind of just doing our job, all of that stuff does add up and it changes our perspective and it makes us put up with things that we otherwise wouldn't put up with because we've become so numb to them. And so I think we have a responsibility, whatever you end up doing in technology, I know many of you are students, wherever you end up, whether you're in academia or in industry, we have to think about the unintended consequences of every single thing we create from the very beginning, no matter what. And the other thing that I think we have to change, that I think is deeply, deeply embedded in the culture here, is that we tend to worship speed. Silicon Valley has like really worshiped speed for, oh gosh, at least a decade, where faster is always better, right? And even though you can say like Facebook no longer has the motto of move fast, break things, they still have the culture deep within that company and deep within this industry of moving fast and breaking things. And so when you worship speed, there's so much that you lose out on. There's so much that you miss because you think that speed is success. Erica Hall has this post, um, Thinking in Triplicate. It's on Medium. It's really great. Uh, I recommend reading it. It's a good long read. She says, you know, things like lean methodology and minimum viable product, they're supposed to reduce waste and increase the timely flow of useful feedback. Get to market faster. Those are seen as like de facto goods, inherent goods, right? In practice, though, they're used as a cover for rushing to a less thoughtful solution without considering the context of the long-term implications. I'm not saying that we shouldn't think about lean or agile processes. I'm not saying that we shouldn't sometimes think about what a minimum viable product is. But if we are only hurtling forward toward that as quickly as we can without thinking what the context or the long-term implications are, we are going to continue hurting people. And if you do go out into a tech company, or frankly, any company that has embedded technology deep within its practice, which is like every company now, we have to be thinking about inclusion, we have to be thinking about ethics, we have to be thinking about worst case scenarios at every part of our process. It's not like an additional piece of the process. I've actually worked with some companies where they've said, um, well, we really wanna do this, but we're trying to figure out like, how do we add this new phase onto our work? And I'm kind of like, well, whoa, whoa, that's a problem in and of itself. This is not a new phase you add onto your work. This is a shift in how you work. So when you're thinking about your roadmap, when you're thinking about your use cases, when you are thinking about you know, critiques, right? Like I talked to an organization where they hold like a weekly um, design critique session. It's an open session. Anybody in the entire design organization can come to it and they critique work in progress. I'm like, okay, that is a perfect opportunity to raise flags. Do people know what flags to be raising? Do they have the vocabulary to talk about it? Are they empowered to talk about it? Do they feel like they'll be listened to if they bring something up? This is not a new phase. This is just something you need to build in to that very, very great moment for it. They're perfectly designed for it. But nobody knows how to do it or isn't sure they're gonna be supported if they do it. And then I also think we need to be valuing a lot more perspectives and backgrounds and skill sets in technology. Now, I am not coming from a computer science background or an engineering background. I went to journalism school. And sometimes I've had people deeply question whether I deserve to be having this conversation. I've had people question whether I deserve to have any opinion on algorithms. And the thing is, I don't need to be a computer scientist to be able to have an opinion on how technology functions and the impact that it has on communities. And in fact, I think what we need are a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. Certainly not just my background either. Uh, for example, one of the things I was very, very disappointed by in the whole Google memo incident, um, there was a lot that I was personally disappointed by in that incident, but one of the things that really got me was this recommendation that James Damore had for Google. So he said that one of the things Google needed to do to solve its so-called problem of um, like thinking that it could have more uh, gender balance in the company was that he said we should de-emphasize empathy. Being emotionally unengaged helps us better reason about the facts. I think this is one of the biggest lies that we tell ourselves in a field like STEM. Because I don't actually think that being rational about the facts will solve any of the problems that we are facing. 
I think we are facing fundamental, huge human issues that require us to let go of some sense of rationality and a sense of neutrality, because what we're doing has never been neutral. And we need to actually think about this in probably like the most human terms we can, and in fact, the most emotional terms we ha can, because technology is entangled with people's most intimate lives. Like, we are building technology that impacts every single bit of people's lives. And we are entangling technology with our most crucial systems of society, right? Like, who goes to jail? How voting systems work? We are embedding technology into all of these places where it's incredibly crucial that we understand. We understand the context that we're working within. And that context is people. And so to do that, we have to be much more emotionally engaged, not less emotionally engaged. And that is something that makes a lot of people coming out of computer science like deeply skeptical um, because there's so much emphasis on like reason, rationality, we are going to log logic our way through everything. And the fact is we're facing problems you can't logic your way out of. Because when you do, what you don't have, you don't have any clarity about like whose job is it going to be to consider the psychological and emotional safety of our users? That's a really, really hard thing to work on if you're obsessed with reasoning about the facts. Who gets to decide what fairness is? If anybody has a universally accepted and mathematically quantifiable definition of fairness, please see me after this class. It is very hard. Fair is a very hard question to answer because fair has to do with culture. Fair has to do with perspective. Fair has to do with so many factors. So we need people who can like deal with deciding what we mean when we say fair. And I don't think any one person needs to be responsible for deciding what fairness means. And I definitely don't think you should have one random computer scientist who happened to be the person who coded that part of the algorithm deciding what fairness means for everybody else. Who's gonna help us with historical context? Like, if you're gonna build a product that impacts people's financial lives, like decides whether or not they are eligible for a loan, and you're using location data, like zip code, address, where they live, somewhere in that algorithm, do you have anybody who understands the history of redlining and the fact that we systematically denied loans to huge numbers of black Americans for decades? And if you don't, if all you have are technologists in the room and nobody's responsible for understanding that history, what are you gonna miss? And how might you be recreating those same systems in the future? And for all of those unintended consequences, whose job is that? What I have seen so far is that is nobody's job. And there's nobody who loses their job if you fail. So what I wanna leave you with is an idea that as all of you go out into whatever your careers shape up as, whatever you wanna do next, I think we need to understand that part of our job has to be rocking some boats. Like, we can't afford to just say, we're just gonna let it slide because the company keeps making money. We're just gonna let it slide because the research is interesting. We can't look around and kind of say, like, things are okay. Even at a place like Stanford, where I know that there is a lot of very interesting research happening, there's also a lot of excitement about technology, there is a lot of money, there is a lot of high profile work happening in this valley. We can't walk around and just accept that what's happening today actually works. We can't necessarily assume that the things that we're building are going to be harmless, and we can't assume that this is gonna last forever the way it stands. And so I wanna leave you with a quote, it's a quote from Audre Lorde. In 1982, she was giving a talk where she had talked about what had changed during her time in the civil rights movement from the 60s to the 80s. And she talked about a lot of things that had changed and a lot of things that hadn't changed. And she said, you know, the thing is, revolution is not a one-time event or something that happens around us rather than inside of us. Change is the immediate responsibility of each of us wherever and however we are standing. I think about this a lot because I get overwhelmed by the size and the scope of the problems that, that I'm talking about in tech. And I get overwhelmed by the amount of power the companies have and the fact that like I'm just this one random person who has just enough power to get in front of this class, but definitely not enough power to change everything at a place like Facebook or Google. But I think it's so important to remember change is the responsibility of me and it's the responsibility of every single one of you. So what are the principles that you'll use to guide your choices? What matters to you? What do you actually believe in? You may not believe the same things as me. You may disagree with some of what I've said, but if you haven't thought about the principles that actually should underlie your decisions, then you might wind up making some choices down the line that you deeply regret. Are you willing to say no? Are you willing to say no to a company that'll pay you a lot of money to do work that you think is fundamentally screwed up? 
If you're not willing to say no, how much do you actually value it? And how much are you willing to risk for those values? Are you willing to risk parts of your reputation? Are you willing to risk opportunities? Those are really hard and personal choices to make, but I encourage all of you to think deeply about what those might look like for you. Thank you. Thank you.